A young woman walks to her computer, dick swinging between her legs. She's ready to make fun of a disabled person, radiating with confidence. Am I talking about one of those special women you hear about on the animes? One of those Sundares, perhaps? No, it's Vriska Serket. Vriska is a graphite-skinned alien from another world, where the blood itself has turned gay as hell. Essentially, the shorter your wavelength, the less that you suck. And Vriska is reasonably high up on this scale. She's one of the twelve members of her kind to play pretentious sword art online, with the aim of trying to birth a new universe and develop into figures of legend. She fights with a fucking pair of dice. And also the ability to mind control others. Take a wild guess which is more effective. Vriska is an obvious sociopath. She's also extremely entertaining. Let me read out a few things she does in this story. She forces someone to jump off a cliff, disabling them. Then, she demands he apologize for being a cripple, and deliberately builds stairs all around his house. She brainwashes someone to stare into the sun so long that they blind themselves. She also brainwashes someone else into killing their friend. She deliberately works to create an unkillable enemy, because her ego won't allow her to win unless it's over something impossible. The people she's with, who have somehow tolerated her up until this point, say, No, stop. He'll figure out where we are and kill us all. And she ignores them, because she's so awesome. The thought of this ending in anything other than absolute victory is just fucking inconceivable. So she goes out to find him and, Oh, look, they were right, and he went to kill them instantly. No, how could this have happened? Then she dies. It's fucking hilarious. Because she's so brazen. Normally, evil hides behind a billion layers of bullshit. Not Vriska. She just goes balls to the walls, constantly. How upsetting it is when villains achieve victory unearned through deception, or intimidation, or other cheap cantrips. Not her. Not Vriska Serket. Although she thinks of herself as a manipulator, it's made abundantly clear that the only thing she really has going for her is raw power, applied liberally over a broad surface. Her conquests are honest, purchased with blood, and they are awful. It's amusing when she wins and especially when she loses. She's like Dennis from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia in a dress. Just put Dennis in a dress, or really any member of the gang, and give them magical superpowers and you basically have Vriska Serket. At some point, one of her plans has come around to chomp her in the ass, and guess what? She's dying. But there's a catch. If she can die on a secret stone bed, she won't actually die, but instead turn into a fucking deity that can fly, manipulate probability, and is hundreds of times stronger than her former self. Because she can't get there on her own, she uses her power to brainwash a young man to carry her to said bed. However, she releases control of him once there, because she's too weak and trusts that he'll finish the job for her quickly. But because he's a regular kid, and not a depraved asshole, he recoils in horror at this and leaves, letting her bleed out very slowly and painfully. But you know what I'd do? I'd reach over and calmly push her off the bed. And then leave. Now that would be funny. You see... Vriska's whole deal is that she pretends she's doing all this awful shit to make everyone stronger. That's why she's constantly pestering Tavros the shitblood. She's pressing him to get tougher and stronger, enough that he can survive in the world. But to anyone with a brain in their head, that's a bunch of malarkey. Yeah, she's making them stronger, huh? That must be why so many of them ended up paraplegic, and narcoleptic, and dead. Hey man, when you're making an omelette, you have to break a few eggs. Sometimes even all of the eggs. And sometimes they end up on the floor. That's what effective cooking looks like. It's bullshit, is what it is. And her insistence on it when pressed is so pathetically transparent, it's amazing. The one time it actually works out is when she cuts the crap and uses her powers to help someone. But this is mainly brought about by a simpering envy for one of her former victims, and for the most part, she's far more interested in being a horrible person. All of this culminates near the end of the story. 
But before that, I want to bring up something that comes by a little earlier. After killing another person, completely unnecessarily by her own admission, Vriska slows down and actually seems to feel regret for her actions. She's connected to the central character of the series, whom she harbors unfocused affection for, and, in a surprising turn for her character, actually talks about her feelings. She talks about the barbaric alien culture she emerged from, and how from a young age she was forced into violent behavior befitting her ilk. She reflects on the image she modeled herself after, and how the way she's feeling now differs from that image. The central character says that's not a bad thing. She ponders after the weakness of humanity, and agrees. They agree to speak again in the future. This scene invites us to consider her in a different light. It asks us to consider the cause of her actions, rather than just their effect. It reminds us that, in spite of the way she acts, she's still very young, only 13 years old. She is a child from a cruel, broken, miserable world. And although that doesn't excuse what she's done, it also doesn't preclude the possibility of advancement. Will she change? Can she change? There is one other incident that hints at this possibility. As I said, because power cannot cure stupidity, Vriska ends up dead. And since death means exactly fuck all in this universe, she ends up in an afterlife directly next door to the real world. She even gets resurrected at one point, with the one condition being that she has to share a body with her former victim, Tavros. Of course, because she's fucking pathetic, this arrangement doesn't even last 30 seconds and ends in a pithy explosion. <laughs> but, regardless of her efforts, that's not the end of it. Her now twice-dead self and Tavros, her victim, stare at each other on a sandy planet, and it's revealed that, while they were connected, they could feel each other's hearts and soul. Tavros could feel her self-esteem, and Vriska felt, uh, just how miserable he was all the time. The setup here is obvious. Both of them will rub off on each other. Tavros will learn to stand up for himself, and Vriska will learn to respect the feelings of others, becoming more empathetic and effective as a leader. Both of them will develop, and in that way, they'll both win. Well, that's not what happened. Dead Vriska continues to be a horrible person, to the point that she alienates everyone she's journeying with. After pointlessly mocking and deriding Tavros for something like the 50th time since their death, he actually stands up to her and fucking leaves her big dumb show by flying away as a ghost. And he's followed by nearly a full half of her crew. Now, for context, Vriska is leading the crew on a mission to find a secret weapon that can kill the ultimate villain of the series, whose presence is, itself, a world-ending event. As in, he could annihilate them on an existential level. As in, he could kill them for real this time. It's actually within their best interests, by a wide margin, to see this voyage through. But they'd still rather take their chances alone than deal with her. That's how awful she is. Did I mention that she's casually killing hundreds of people for this plan in the first place? To lead them in a shitty circle? Yeah, you know, mass death, no big deal. No appreciation or sense of gravity for what she's doing. Look at how cool we look in pirate clothes. So anyways, Tavros leaves. And although he's likely putting himself at greater danger, he's happier for the decision. It's presented as a triumphant moment for him. It's worth pointing out that this is likely because of Riska's influence from before. He references self-esteem, he referenced it earlier during their brief exchange post-death, it only started to manifest in a productive manner after their conversation, once he felt what real self-esteem felt like. This is her rubbing off on him, and he's better off for it. But what about Vriska? She seems unaffected so far. Well, we're getting to that. In the next stage of this fucking comedy of errors, they're abandoned again by someone they actually fucking need. And then the maximal brilliance of Shit Eater Supreme and her fascist worshipping cohort comes in. What do you think they do? What do you think these strong, independent women do to prove their mettle in the face of adversity? What do they do? Here's what they do. They throw up their hands and say, Fuck it! Let's just go frolic around in a fucking field and make out. 
and that's precisely what they do. There's a bit of deliberation behind this decision, but not much. Her cohort is especially gung-ho about it, like, yeah, let's just abandon the world. And then both of them just decide to have lesbian adventures. They even found the secret weapon in the end, they're just not going to use it, because of reasons. This, you see, is Tavros's feedback. Remember when he said he himself wanted to frolic around and relax while dead? He never wanted to go on this adventure. He never wanted anything to do with it. And now, she doesn't either. During this time, further parallels emerge when Friska lets someone else impact her general look and changes her hair to look similar to his. This is his input. Now, that looks pretty bad. But this assessment may be incomplete. Because during this time, she actually seems to reflect on her actions, about how forcing her will blindly on others blew up in her face, and again, how she isn't her ancestor. Savvy viewers might be sick of her only seeming to pause and reflect when the crap beats down her own door, but this time, she actually follows through on what she said once before. This time, she lets her baggage go, and for perhaps the first time, she actually seems to be happy. It's bittersweet, but maybe it's for the best. Maybe it's just what she needs, to step out of the spotlight for a change and move on. Besides, she's not the only person that can fight for the world, right? Only, she is, and a big part of what comes next is using off-brand time travel to bring her back to life. The central character does some bullshit, and invalidates the consequences for Vriska acting as she did. A new version of events forms, and predictably, now Vriska just paints her will over everyone unopposed. She becomes the leader of the group, more or less the driving tactical force of the party, yeah. Steals the work of her older timeline self, and in the end deals the final blow against the villain just like she wanted, without issue. During this time, she claims to have developed and grown as a person, but to anyone with a brain in their head, that's an obvious farce. Also during this time, she defends her use of psionic powers to pervasively spy on her friends' private lives. She defends the way she treated Tavros. Later, when the old version of Tavros actually shows up and proves himself to be useful by generating an army, she doesn't treat him with respect, but rather as though it's some affront to her superiority. Oh, and later on, when everything is said and done, she ends another relationship in murder and declares terroristic war on the planet. This is the most human and developed character in the series? Really, guys? She is not developed. She's just learned how to hide her depravity. And poorly at that. This becomes the most clear when she confronts her former self. While working to try and fight the villain, Vriska comes across her and Mina. And uh, let's just skip to the end here. The living Vriska acts unnecessarily cruel to her dead self, and steamrolls over her development and self-reflection with petty insults, calling her useless, disgusting, etc, etc, fucking etc. She drives the dead Vriska, the one that actually changed and grew as a person, to tears, and steals her friend away too, leaving her broken and miserable. It's a point of unambiguous failure. You might be asking yourself, why do these things have to be mutually exclusive? Why does the nice, actually developed Vriska have to be portrayed as ineffectual, while the sociopath Vriska has to be the only one that can do shit? Because we live in a society. Jokes aside, I appreciate the real-world wisdom conveyed in this part of the story. Because here's the kicker. Ultimately, the world was better off for Vriska's influence. No matter how pointlessly and obnoxiously awful she was, Everyone got ahead by listening to her. They just had to listen to her this whole time. She was right all along. The serial murderer was right all along. And in fact, if you look back on it, the version of Tavros that actually accomplished anything was also influenced by her too. Her essence was the solution. Tavros's was poison. To me, the message from all this is abundantly clear. When the going gets tough, you need the aggressive sociopath to function. Regardless of flaws or inability to progress, their strength is necessary, and everyone else just has to buck up and deal. Isn't it lovely? I think it's lovely. 
because it proves that there is absolutely no moral reason that Aradin shouldn't have had a chance at redemption. That's right, plot twist, it's an Aradin video. Bet you didn't see that one coming. In a lot of ways, Aradin is like Vriska. Both are extremely powerful, both can be pretty shitty, and in the end, both of them are heavily dependent on connections with others. Except that this is a false equivalence, because Vriska is way worse, and between the two of them, Aradin deserved a second chance far more than she did. Not everyone agrees with that statement, but to put it bluntly, they should, because literally everything he does, she does worse. Like, what is the argument here? That he killed someone? Vriska did too, and hundreds during her plan, and thousands before the events of the story. Also, Vriska herself acknowledges that at least one of her killings was completely superfluous, whereas Aradin only killed those that were, uh, charging at him with bladed weapons and proved more than capable of killing him. Is it because Aradin was creepy and hit on a bunch of people? Vriska did that too, and unlike Aradin, who actually seems to respect when people reject him, however begrudgingly, she physically molests Tavros, and also roofies him. Classy. Is it because Aradin isn't as powerful as Vriska? Unlike Vriska, Aradin actually has a practical weapon from the very beginning, which only grows stronger in time. He's also prophesied to destroy the Lord of Angels, with the main villain being classified as a cherub. And he was already able to destroy an entire planet of superpowered angels on his own. If nothing else, he has incredible combat ability. And to a certain extent, killing the main villain is literally written into his character. Is it because Aradin had a bad plan that was probably going to lead to their deaths? Vriska actually did that shit, you dinguses. Is it because Aradin can't change? There's not really much to say on this front, but I'm just going to point something out. Around the time Vriska is revived in a shared body with Tavros, Aradin has the same treatment with his enemy, Solux. In many ways, the relationship between these two is even worse than with Vriska and Tavros, accentuated by racism and murderous contempt. But even with all these things going with him, Aradin manages to keep it together with Solix, to the point that he gets to be helpful to the others and even apologize to his victim. Compare and contrast this to Vriska, who gives up in the space of a minute. Is it because Aradin is racist? Well, okay, let's see which one of these characters does more damage to the low bloods over the course of the comic. Vriska tormented and killed the rust blood, tormented and killed the shit blood, and traumatized the piss blood by forcing him to kill his friend. The low bloods are actually disproportionately affected by her rampages, because they're more susceptible to her stupid mind control powers. And she certainly doesn't mind playing along with racist ideology when the mood strikes her. Aridin entered a duel with Solix, which was agreed to by both parties, and... And... As far as I know, he doesn't have a single negative interaction with Aradia or Tavros. And with Karkat, he actually tries to speak with him for advice, and sympathizes with him when it's clear that the latter is feeling grief. As an aside... The social caste system established by the Hema Spectrum is supposed to be pretty severe. Early on, one troll doubts that she could get a favor from someone a mere two tiers above her, and there is a strong, visceral sense of division between the high bloods and low bloods, with the former often violently culling the latter. Furthermore, by it, there is also a natural feud between sea dwelling trolls and land dwelling trolls. Yet Aradin seems quite willing to fraternize with these people, and on some level clearly cares about their relationship. What could this mean? I don't know. It is a mystery. Regardless, Vriska has a demonstrably higher body count. The Matriorb. Beck Noir. For fuck's sake. Is it because Aradin is privileged, and therefore completely irredeemable? Having Mina on your side kind of invalidates that argument. Oh, right, I haven't really talked about her much. Here's what you need to know. On the privilege scale, she's even privilegier than Aradin. She also unironically worships her fascist future self, who started their plant's racist system to begin with and actually conducted mass genocide. 
And this is never really acknowledged or called out in any meaningful capacity, because why would it be? Compare and contrast this with Aridin, whose time on screen with others is almost nothing but increasingly severe and unproductive callouts of his failings. She's also treated like a super effective leader, which is interesting, because as we see in lurid detail, she was incapable of recruiting or constructively using a single member of her own group, in spite of the majority of them having obvious hang-ups she could have exploited. One of them even says, if you command me to, I'll obey, but instead she just plugs her ears like a moron and says, all of you suck except me. That's Mina. That's the second very necessary sociopath in the finale. Yeah, we need her to tell the troll copies to blindly charge at the enemy without any discernible level of coordination in their attack. Solix doesn't hang back and use his psionic abilities to blast the enemy from a distance. Equius isn't on the forefront, distracting him with raw strength. No, just all of you charge the enemy. Maybe the weight of your bodies will be enough to stop him. You know, the sort of thing that you would expect from a great leader. The sort of thing you would expect from a person like Vriska Serket. Now bear in mind, this isn't to say that Aridin is innocent by any stretch of the imagination. Like, yeah, he's a bag of dicks. He has issues, and alienates people for a reason. I'm not denying that, or trying to downplay it. But, next to someone who killed literally thousands of people, and this incompetent tub of fuck masquerading in pink, the bar has been set pretty low, people. It's my view that he exhibits both greater potential than Vriska for development, and also greater reward in seeing that development through. And isn't that kind of the underlying point of the story in the first place? For people to develop into healthier adults? Another successful player suggests he was the same way when he was young too. And when someone actually takes the time to understand and work with Aridin's issues, he seems to respond. Although at that point, it's too little to prevent catastrophe. But no. Instead, make way for these two fuckballs to march down the yellow brick road and shit on the passerby, their garbage is acceptable. They are the ones who are necessary to save the world. They are the ones for whom all is permitted. They are the ones who saved 15% or more on car insurance. They are... C'est juste déprimant. Comment sommes-nous? Tu as pissé dans ce violon, you super tour. Finile, afin que nous puissions partir à la chasse. Une minute. Je ne parle pas cette langue. To summarize... Spider-Man, Into the Spider-Verse, is a good movie, but goddamn do I hate that anime girl. Her facial expressions make me want to pile drive a child into a wood chipper. Like, what is wrong with you? Why do you have to be this way? I wanted more scenes with the Green Goblin, and also Kingpin looking like an egg. Still, it has a lot going for it. The gender-swapped Dr. Octopus is really fun, and the main character isn't as obnoxious as I thought he'd be. It's got robust action sequences, incredible visuals, great comedy, and some pretty neat ideas in general. The soundtrack can be a bit annoying, though. Oh, and Vriska. She's pretty cool, too. People say that she's well-developed and complex, but that's not why I like her. I like her because she demonstrates, truly, you don't have to be a good person to be a hero. If you're important enough, you can get away with the most heinous of shit, because the universe will bend over backwards to accommodate you. And really, isn't that a lesson all of us have to learn? Thank you, Homestuck, for this wonderful comedy. Because that's what it is. A mean-spirited parody of ethics that effectively undercuts whatever moral the story presumes to teach. The Hema Spectrum? Validated. Domineering behavior? Justified. All of her actions are, if not outright vindicated, treated as acceptable by the rest of the cast at large. And when the corrupt are viewed as just, that corruption suddenly becomes much more visceral, doesn't it? And there's something else beyond that, too. Would you like to know another fun fact about the relationship between Vriska and Mina? In spite of the way that they're stylized, there is an age difference between the two of them. Vriska is 13 years old. Mina is 19 years old. While they're making out. 
during which time Friska is exhibited as having greater maturity and genuine happiness. Yes, that's right. One of the most popular webcomics around canonically presents a pedophilic relationship in a positive light. I think I can speak for everyone when I say, what the hell, man? It's just dropped in so casually that you couldn't even be blamed for missing it. But I didn't. And neither did Mina. What, you gonna eat a toddler next? I left this detail out earlier for the sake of dramatic tension and hope. But know that even what you saw here was a false salvation. Granted credence only by virtue of how amazingly awful the other Vriska is. Some people might get mad at me for saying this. Some people might even be inclined to trot out clumsy excuses for this kind of behavior. But they invariably fail. Because A. People stop aging when they die. B. This is demonstrated by the dead Vriska being shorter and more diminutive than her older, 16-year-old living counterpart, even through the stylization. C. Mina herself proves that she views Vriska as younger than said 16-year-old counterpart in this conversation here. And D. The fact that you have to spin these excuses to begin with should be indicative of something in and of itself. I used the word maybe for a reason back there. Neither ending was good. And so the comedy is joined with tragedy. There is no light at the end of this tunnel. No true hope of development for her character. Only a brainless desire to recreate the conditions she was raised in, and be worshipped by a captive audience, even as they break beneath her. A tyrant fighting tyrants, until one side is a pile of blood in pulp. Vriska is not complex. However, she is entertaining, and horrifying as well in scope. For in this setting, the damage she can do becomes much more significant than scattering rock and splitting carapace. There's more, let's say, room for collateral damage. She has at least one dumb little toady wrapped up in her image, and she has made her intentions clear. Vicious and predictable, like an insect. If you turn a swarm of wasps on a crowd, the outcome is certain. And this is considered more acceptable than the kid who vaguely reminds us of incels. Like, he's 13 years old, guys. This isn't Elliot Rogers at age 22. It's not like he's casually brainwashing hundreds of people into the gas chambers and then relying on disingenuous sophistry to try and unperson them. He's not doing that. In the epilogues, the author seems to mistake redemption for amnesty. And you know, that's understandable. The two are only a few hundred pages apart in the dictionary. But I understand the message. Just because someone had a bad upbringing doesn't mean they should be given a blank check to do whatever they want. One should try to understand and work with them, but after a certain point, you've got to draw the line and hold them accountable. Just as long as you can reasonably say you've done all you can, you shouldn't be afraid to call out exploitive or abusive behavior. It's actually quite admirable. Oh look, there's the main character embracing Vriska after she casually risked his son's life under a hail of gunfire. Like, what is this? A video game character that I'm controlling? All I'm saying is that either John has dementia, or the people writing this story have dementia. Either way, I'm invested. Because usually, ethics is inversely proportional to how enjoyable a given thing is. And with such an obviously broken and horrible story, the lower bound no longer exists. Will the toady get sick of Vriska and strangle her to death with her own intestines? Will Vriska chainsaw an infant and then have the narrative insist it was necessary for the continuation of the universe? Will Orphaner Dualscar come back and put these bitches in their place? Will Aridin actually get a chance at having a fully developed story instead of being childishly scribbled out by an author with obvious personal baggage? It's all on the table. In case it's become unclear, I'll reiterate. I like Friska. She's a horrible person. I'm a horrible person. She uses the illusion of necessity as an excuse for awful and exploitative behavior. I'd probably do the same. 
But what tickles me about this whole situation is that Homestuck regularly tries to put forward a moral message about the importance of feelings and understanding others and how everyone's important in their own special way, and then it has a character like this. A character that is rewarded in spite of her failure to move beyond egomania and impulsive violence. A character that is celebrated both by her world and outside of it, in spite of, or how perhaps even because of, her puerile tantrums and lack of self-awareness. A character that is as likely to commit atrocities as she is to deliver witty one-liners while doing so. It has a character like this at the forefront, and then it expects to be taken seriously. The cognitive dissonance is incredible. Why shouldn't Aridin get a second chance next to someone like this? And why should I care if Jane is racist if the most influential trolls in the Rebellion do in fact seem to reflect her suspicions? There is no good answer to this. Because at this point, it's barely even a question. It's a joke. And I eagerly await the punchline.